welcome, everyone. I'm Karen Donfried with the German Marshall Fund of the United States, and I'm so delighted to welcome you to the event, which is both a retrospective on the Marshall Plan, but we also really want to look forward and ask ourselves, what are the lessons for today as we are nearing the 70th anniversary of the Marshall Plan? And for those of you who know GMF, our mission statement is strengthening transatlantic cooperation in the spirit of the Marshall Plan. And if you've wondered what that means, you will learn today <laughs> what that means. And it's a special anniversary, not only because it's 70 years of that famous speech that then Secretary of State George Marshall gave at Harvard University on June 5, 1947. It's also GMF's 45th anniversary. So we've been here for part of that history. And you know, when we think back on the Marshall Plan, there is so much that was ambitious at the time. And not only because we're sitting in a Senate office building, I have this Congressional Research Services two-pager on the Marshall Plan, and I'll admit, I started my career at CRS, so it's near and dear to my heart. But the opening line, June 5, 2017, marks the 70th anniversary of the Marshall Plan considered by many to be one of the most successful foreign policy initiatives and foreign aid programs ever undertaken by the United States. That explains the staying power of the Marshall Plan and why if you Google Marshall Plan, you find millions of Marshall Plans that have been proposed but none of them have ever taken off in the same way. And I just want to remind us that at that time, if you look at the 1949 Appropriations Act, 12% of the US federal budget went to this assistance. And it wasn't humanitarian assistance. It was a recovery act. It was about helping Europe recover from the war. And I think often if you look back, it's not just about nostalgia, but what are the lessons we can draw from that history for our own time? And there's so much interesting about the Marshall Plan, but I would make the case that the strong transatlantic relationship we've enjoyed over the past 70 years goes back to the Marshall Plan and the foresight and leadership that was shown then. If we think about today, May 9, it's Europe Day. The EU has celebrated 60 years of the Rome Treaty, but I noticed that in a lot of the signatures from European ambassadors around this city, it's 60 years Treaty of Rome next to 70 years Marshall Plan. Because inherent in the Marshall Plan was also the goal of encouraging European cooperation and unity. So we think about the world we live in today and how much of that can be traced back to the Marshall Plan. And I couldn't be more delighted to have the three speakers we have today to help us unpack the meaning of this. I am deeply indebted to Senator Shaheen for making time for this. We all know how crazy your schedule is, and it is her commitment to the transatlantic relationship, to the values and principles that are embodied in the Marshall Plan that explain why she wanted to be part of this. You have full bios of everyone on your invitation, so I just am gonna highlight a couple of things about each. As you know, she's a very distinguished member of the US Senate. She is the senior member from the wonderful state of New Hampshire. That means longest serving. <laughs> and um, she has committee assignments right up our alley on the Committee on Foreign Relations and the Committee on Armed Services. And I will say, as I was walking in and chatting uh, with a former colleague of mine, uh, this woman said, you know, Senator Shaheen is the only woman on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and we are really counting on her on a whole set of issues, not only European, but across the foreign policy gamut. So we're delighted you made the time. And as many of you know, we originally had her together 
with another power woman from the other side of the Atlantic who was called back to Brussels. And that, of course, is unfortunate, but we have two incredible individuals who jumped in. One of them is Niels Anen, and I'd like to say he hopped on a plane from Berlin yesterday to be here, but fortunately he was in town and was able to make time for this. And Niels will be known to many in the room. He is a distinguished member of the German Bundestag. He is the spokesperson on foreign affairs for the Social Democratic Party's parliamentary group in the Bundestag. And I shamelessly have to say, he was a senior fellow at the German Marshall <laughs> Fund some years ago. Um, and last but absolutely not least, we have Ambassador David O'Sullivan, who is the European Union senior diplomat here in the United States. He is also in many ways an architect and a builder because the European External Action Service would not exist in the way it does today were it not for David O'Sullivan. And I think each of them bring a different perspective to the conversation that we want to have. And I will say that the conversation we want to have is on the record. So everybody tweets in Washington now, and that includes those in this room. So the hashtag is Marshall70. Catchy, I know. So, you know, we'd encourage you all to feel free to, to spread the lessons that we'll take from this conversation more broadly. So with that said, what I wanted to do is, you know, really turn to each of our speakers, and Senator Shaheen, I want to start with you. As we think back, we need to remember how contentious the Marshall Plan was in 1947. We look back on the halcyon days when there was unity. There wasn't. I mean, we've just come off a brutal war where the United States gave blood and treasure. You have an America that really doesn't want to give large sums of money to Europe. We have a Democratic president in the White House in Harry Truman. We have a Republican majority in Congress, arguably an isolationist majority, that's ready to come back home. And yet, a bipartisan consensus is forged. You have committees that f go across the US making the case for this plan. And I want to sort of give you that backdrop to reflect not only on the plan itself, but what are the lessons that we can draw for that for this incredibly polarized moment we find ourselves in? So Senator Sheen, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Karen, for that nice introduction. And thank you to GMF for hosting this discussion and to my panelists. It's, as Neil said, it takes two men to make up for Frederico Mogherini. So. <laughs> That was a very good line. I thought it was to match Jean Shaheen. <laughs> um, and I would point out that I have the same CRS um, <laughs> brief that talks about the Marshall Plan as the most successful foreign policy initiative. And, you know, as I think about the Marshall Plan, I think about whether we could get that done today. And I think one of, one of the challenges that we have today that they didn't have when the Marshall Plan was done is cable television and instant news and social media, which I think has made it harder to do some of these big ideas. But as you point out, the Marshall Plan has really shaped post-war, the post-war West um, in a way that has been so significant. You know, I remember my first visit to Europe after I got elected to the Senate, and we had a congressional delegation, and we went to um, the Netherlands. And going into the parliament there and having the head of parliament speak to us and talking about how much the American contribution to World War II, both in troops and in terms of support through the Marshall Plan, had met. Um, to them and to Europe. And I think it really laid the foundation for everything that's happened since. And the fact that today, as we look at who are some of our closest allies around the world, of course, it's not just the transatlantic alliance, um, but it's also, 
that includes, I guess I should say, Germany, who was our biggest enemy during World War II, and Japan, which is not part of the Transatlantic Alliance, but is certainly one of our closest allies. And the, the support through the Marshall Plan for Europe, the support for Japan as they were um, getting back on their feet after World War II has just made such a huge difference. And when you think about the money contributed, you know, it was, as you point out, 12% of the federal budget. Um, in today's dollars, $150 billion. Today, that's about three times what we spend on our whole State Department and foreign aid budget, um, which is only about 1%. And, you know, one of the questions I frequently get when I'm talking to my constituents is why are we spending so much money in other countries? And to be able to cite the Marshall Plan is actually a great example to explain to people why it's so important because our, what has happened in America has, since World War II has also been very dependent on that Marshall Plan. The commercial relationship that we have with Europe, the security relationship we have with Europe, NATO, you know, all of that has been um, has benefited from the Marshall Plan, and it's made such a huge difference. And I think, you know, the senator at the time was Senator Vandenberg, hmm. who is the person who talked about politics ending at the water's edge. That was his famous quote. And I think um, it's unfortunate to see that bipartisanship around foreign policy beginning to break down, which it has, sadly, in the last few Congresses. So looking at that bipartisan effort coming to consensus, um, agreeing that this was an investment that made sense, not just for Europe, but for America, is something that is important for us as we think about our investments today. And our foreign policy today. So I'd like to bring Niels Annen in next. And, you know, I work for an organization that's called the German Marshall Fund of the United States. I mean, it was thanks to a generous gift from then West Germany that we were set up to be a living tribute to the Marshall Plan. And one of the, again, many interesting aspects of the Marshall Plan was that West Germany was invited to participate. So the former enemy is invited to be part of this European economic recovery and is part of this Europe that the US wants to see coming together. And, you know, Niels, I'd like to ask you to reflect on that, but also how different would you say the German perspective on the United States is in this year, 2017? Mm -hmm. Well, um, first of all, I, for me it was a surprise to be here today on the podium, but certainly a good surprise. There are not so many good surprises in foreign policy these days, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's always great to be back with GMF, and it's an honor to, to sit here with you, Senator, and we appreciate your leadership on, on European affairs and your strong commitment. Um, and I think... Um, it's, it's good to reflect a little bit on the history of our relationship, which is, of course, an American-European relationship, but as Karen, as you mentioned, the very fact that the funds were not only um, offered to Europe that was destroyed by the army of my country, but also um, the country that was the origin and the and, 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 and the culpable of, of that development was an extraordinary gesture. And I mean, I only know this from reading history books and studying history, but also from um, kitchen tables discussion in my family, because I'm lucky to <clears throat> have known my four grandparents, which is very rare in my generation. Um, that this was not only an economic contribution to the recovery and the reconstruction of Germany and Europe, or at least then the Western part of Europe, but maybe the most important message was that 
the Americans that defeated the German army and liberated our country were not only talking about democracy and democratic values, but I think it, it, it was a stunning gesture that was so strong that even today you see the um, result of that very wise long-term strategy by, by leaders here in the United States that, as you mentioned, also had to fought um, <clears throat> a domestic political battle to make that happen. And the term Marshall Plan is still so powerful that it has been used in all kinds of occasions. You know, colleagues from the eastern part of Germany after unification demanded a Marshall Plan for East Germany because there were so many economic problems. Our Minister for Economic Cooperation and Development just um, announced a Marshall Plan for Africa, which is, given the budget that he possesses, a very ambitious plan, but that's another, <laughs> another discussion. And, and so I, I think it's, it's very, very strong, still in, enshrined in, in the German um, narrative and, and, and discussion. But, of course, it's less my generation and the younger generation, um, but more the generation of my parents and those who are still alive from the war generation. So I think what we are experiencing is that each generation needs to make the case. And we can make the case for a renewed transatlantic partnership, but it needs two to tango. And, and what we are seeing right now is that, that uh, an, a sentiment that has always existed in German uh, society, um, an anti-American sentiment that was never the majority but always there and could be mobilized, um, has gained some additional arguments um, since the inauguration of your new president. And I think what we are all trying to find out is what will the policy be? Germany is a new position. Um, <coughs> I think in all modesty, because right now our economy is surprisingly stable and adding jobs, it's very robust. But also politically, we are right now very stable, although we are in an election year. But there's no fundamental choice in Germany between a pro-European and an anti-European candidate and on the ballot in September. There are a lot of choices. I could use the remaining time to talk about it. Um, why? A German citizen should cast their vote for my candidate, but it's, it's not the choice the French people had between anti and pro-European. So you can all be very relaxed as long as you're not a German citizen. Um, and I think that's a good and a very strong message, and it's also an offer, an offer to cooperate, and I think we are desperately looking for partners to solve the problems in our own region, but also in our difficult neighborhood when I'm talking about Syria, Iraq, Libya, North Africa, Russia, I could add to the list. And so um, I think there's a, a consciousness in, in Germany that expectations towards our role are sometimes very, very high, um, but that we also have a responsibility because the very fact that we are so strong right now, relatively strong, um, is also based in the help that we received when we were um, <coughs> in, in dire needs and um, could not expect to find friends that we have been fighting on the battlefield. So, Ambassador Sullivan, this also brings us to the European Union, and, and Niels, you spoke eloquently about that. And, you know, one of the other things I always find so interesting about the Marshall Plan is that it really wasn't a plan. <laughs> I mean, George Marshall laid out an idea, a concept, but he really said to the European countries involved, you all tell us what you need. The OEC, the Organization for European Economic Cooperation, was set up as a mechanism for that, but also it was those 16 members of the OEC that had to decide how to divvy up 
the assistance. I mean, it's really quite clever on the Americans' part. We're not going to make that decision. You all tell us how this should be divided, what you need. And that pattern of cooperation was one of many elements, of course, that came together to then produce a European coal and steel community, a European community, a European Union. Um, Niels mentioned France. I think there was probably a collective sigh of relief shared by most people in this room that the French presidential election came out the way that it did. But we can't underestimate the forces that are there aligned against the European project. And so, Ambassador Selvin, I'd like to, again, have you reflect sort of what's the core lesson you might draw from the Marshall Plan and then apply that to the challenges that are there today. Well, thank you very much, Karen. Thank you to the GMF for organizing this event. Thank you to my two fellow panelists, Senator Shaheen, such a good friend of, of Europe. We really appreciate uh, all that you do and, and your consistent support. And uh, uh, Niels Annan for stepping in at the last minute uh, very, very ably. Uh, and I apologize on behalf of Federica Mogherini. I can't tell you how much she was looking forward to this event. Uh, she is a passionate uh, defender of the German Marshall Fund and also a former fellow. Uh, and she really, 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 really wanted to. You, so you've placed your people well, Karen. So, uh, she, really, she really wanted to be here. And unfortunately, you, you know how her job goes. She was uh, required to return prematurely to, to, to Brussels. And so she sends her regrets to all of you. Um, going back on, on you know, looking at the history, I mean, I was just in New Orleans uh, last week, and I visited the National World War II Museum, which is actually a remarkable uh, museum. I mean, somewhat sad, but very well done. Uh, and I, I was struck, as I always have been, by uh, how after the Second World War, which was the second time what I would call two European civil wars uh, provoked global conflicts and, and the Holocaust, uh, the vision of people like George Marshall, but many others, because America didn't just help us win the war, they helped us win the peace. And it was a unique vision. Uh, if you contrast it with Versailles, which was yeah. you know, a dreadful end to the, the First World War, and which basically laid the seeds of the Second World War in the way that we know, uh, the vision here was a completely different vision. It was a vision of generosity and reaching out and saying, let's Let's find a different way of doing business. And you're absolutely right. The uh, generosity of the, the financial generosity and the generosity of spirit of the United States, which, by the way, uh, and Senator Sheen has rightly mentioned this, is to be found also in, in how the situation in Japan was handled. Uh, because you know, that could have been seen somewhat differently. And that's, that's another story, but it's, it's a huge tribute to American diplomacy that at the end of that global conflict, America set out actually to help everyone build a better peace. And in Europe, uh, of course, uh, we also had, frankly, generosity of spirit uh, on, on the side of many Europeans. Uh, today is Schumann Day, uh, and we had the generosity of spirit of particularly Franco-German reconciliation, that within five years of the end of the war, uh, Robert Schumann could come forward with a proposal which would be supported by Germany to pool the instruments of war, coal and steel, and to make war almost unthinkable. This was a, a remarkable achievement. And it wouldn't have been possible, you're absolutely right, without that impetus from uh, uh, the, the American side to provide the framework and the money and the lubricant and the incentive. But also, let us be frank, the willingness on the European side <coughs> to say, we can't continue like this. We need a different business model for Europe, as I like to say sometimes. We have to find a different way of living and working together on this continent. And it has been remarkably successful uh, in, in the ways that you know. And I was asked, uh, when I was in New Orleans, I was talking, you know, we've had 70 years of uninterrupted peace, relatively speaking, uh, on the European continent, which you have to go back to the 16th century to find the equivalent. And sometimes when I talk about this, frankly, young people say, you know, come on. This peace stuff, we take it, it's very boring. We take it for granted. When you walk around the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, I'll take boring over what's on display in that museum any day of the week. And, and we should not let people take that for granted. And by the way, events in the Balkans, events near our home in, in, in Ukraine and Georgia show us that that peace is not to be taken for granted at any time. Now, what, 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 what lessons do I learn? I would, I would draw two lessons. I mean, I think the first was of transatlantic relations. Um, I think we are vital to each other. And I think we also have to 
show understanding to each other. Um, and I say that deliberately because maybe uh, with the new administration, there are some stresses and strains that might come into the relationship. I think on the European side, we should not forget what America has done for us. And if this is a, a political change in the United States, we have to try and adjust to that and, and understand it and work with it and not just be critical, which is sometimes what's easy for people to do. I'm not saying that we may not have occasions to criticize. But on the other hand, the, the fundamentals of the relationship require us to try and make this work. Uh, and I hope on the American side, equally, uh, we didn't squander the sacrifice of your servicemen and servicewomen. We built a better Europe. Uh, we, we have found a new way of working together. As the senator has said, this has not only been politically very important, we've been an important ally. We have together built the global order on which has brought so much prosperity. But it's also been commercially quite beneficial to the United States. And why shouldn't it be, by the way? Because they contributed handsomely to it. And the single market in Europe, the cross-investment, uh, is a source of enormous mutual, mutual prosperity. My other conclusion is that <coughs> looking outwards, and, and uh, Mr. Ennan has more or less said this, we, we need to try and apply some of the lessons of that vision post-war to other conflict situations. You, you know, the, the answer is try and prevent the conflict, try and build the situations that the conflicts don't start to try to intervene. And it will cost money. It will involve us putting money on the table. The European Union is the largest donor with our member states of development assistance in the world, the largest donor of humanitarian assistance, the United States provides a huge security guarantee and is also a substantial donor in development aid and assistance. But this is indispensable. The, the, the crises that we have in, in Europe's neighborhood, uh, but also in Africa uh, and elsewhere, require us to continue that notion of preventive diplomacy to try and uh, help other people uh, not have their conflicts turn into uh, the tragedy that we've seen in Syria, which is one of the greatest tragedies, I think, of humanitarian tragedies of recent times. So for me, that's an important lesson for both of us. Well, and as we all probably remember, when the Arab Spring started, one of the suggestions was we really needed a Marshall Plan <laughs> to, for the Mideast so that we could try and support those countries that were thinking about um, moving <coughs> towards democracy. And sadly, it never got off the ground, and we are where we are. Senator Sheen, one thing that strikes me about the comments that, that both of our European friends made is uh, Ambassador ourselves was saying, you know, we sort of take peace for granted, and, and maybe to some extent we've also taken transatlantic relations for granted for a long time. And, and Niels was talking about, uh, when he spoke about the U.S., sort of we need two to tango, that Germany might be ready, but they're not sure where the U.S. is in terms of a strong transatlantic relationship. And... I'm interested in your views. You know, you talked about uh, the earlier belief uh, that uh, Senator Vandenberg had about sort of politics should end at the water's edge when you're talking about foreign policy, and yet we've really seen bipartisanship break down around foreign policy as well. Could you imagine a bipartisan consensus growing around the relationship with Europe? And I think about this because, in, as, as we've all commented on, you have been so committed to this relationship. And when I think about the chairs of Senate Foreign Relations Committee or the Senate Armed Services Committee, Senator Corker, Senator McCain, they're also very committed to this relationship. Could we imagine Congress playing a more significant role in, in being a booster, not only of the relationship, but making the case for why the relationship matters to voters in New Hampshire or Arizona, or you know, pick your state. I'd love to draw you out on that. Well, I think we've been seeing that, actually. Um, there has been a lot of talk about how we can better support what's happening in the transatlantic alliance. How can we better support the EU with Brexit and the challenges that that presents with Russia's invasion of Ukraine um, and the challenges that Russia presents to Europe with um, Russia's hacking of our elections and the European elections. We saw um, what happened with France and Macron. We haven't yet seen what that investigation um, may show, but um, there's been a great deal of interest, I think, that's been bipartisan in supporting this relationship and pointing out that it is one of the things that's led to the last 70 years of pretty much stability and that that's been in everybody's interest. You know, we've seen 
Um, that's contributed to the successes we've had in the United States, the prosperity, um, and the prosperity of so, many, so much of Europe. So it's important, and I think in our interest, to su continue to support that relationship. Now, of course, one of the challenges is um, persuading the public that this is on our interest, and particularly for people who um, have not been paying a lot of attention to what happens with our foreign aid budget, who think that it's a lot higher than it is, people who also have challenges in their own communities and so don't understand why, why we should be investing in other countries, not just in Europe, but around the world. Um, it's a challenge right now with this new administration where they have um, at least what we have seen about what's being proposed for a budget for 2018 would dramatically cut back the State Department by about a third, would dramatically cut back assistance programs, would, um, it's not clear how USAID will be handled, and while that doesn't necessarily apply to most of Europe, it does apply to some countries in the Balkans. And so um, there's a lot of uncertainty right now. So on the one hand, we have an understanding, I think, by um, most of the people in the Senate, anyway, who have been um, very involved in foreign policy, that this is really important for us uh, to continue to support. We need to work at this relationship, and we need to do whatever we can to support Europe. And on the other hand, um, we have uncertainty around a new administration and what they're going to do that has sent very mixed messages about the EU, about, I mean, the French election is a good example. President Trump pretty much endorsed Marine Le Pen and the fact that she was thinking about taking France out of the EU. So that kind of a mixed message presents real challenges, I think, and um, trying to figure out how to address that not only here but in Europe I think it's challenging. So you had mentioned earlier the conversation around a Marshall Plan after the Arab Spring. Ambassador O'Sullivan made the comment that really winning the peace is as important as winning the war and you have to invest money in it. And, and Niels, I want to come back to you on this because you talked about your foreign minister being supportive of a Marshall Plan for Africa. And you know we've seen so many proposals for new Marshall Plans, they've never taken off. Because at the end of the day, people aren't willing to put the money there. And just, you know, Niels, you've been a parliamentarian for a long time. Is there a way to create a political consensus around making that kind of investment whether it's in Ukraine, whether it's in countries that have experienced the Arab Spring, whether it's in Syria, is there a political recipe there? Or is it that countries are just gonna say, oh, that's why we have the World Bank and the IMF, thank you very much, it's not our responsibility. Look, I, I believe uh, we should be cautious in using the term Marshall Plan. Uh, why? Because when the Marshall Plan kicked in, Europe was, or huge parts of Europe were destroyed. And I mean, I'm representing a district from my hometown, Hamburg, in the Bundestag. And if you see the pictures of my city, it's almost unbelievable um, that people could have survived this war. And if you see pictures of my city today, it's almost unbelievable what have been created. And I'm cautiously optimistic that you will see quite a few pictures of Hamburg, at least in summer when the G20 meeting is taking place, and I hope you see beautiful pictures and not that much about the, um, the violent demonstrations that we fear a little bit, but that's another topic. But I only can speak for my country. I think the, it's a very fact that, and that's a distinction also to World War I, it was not only the conditions of the Versailles Peace Treaty, but it was also the fact that although the German population also suffered because of the war, the battlefields were in France and Belgium and other parts. So the industrial core was not destroyed. So for 
the extreme right and the Nazi party, it was much easier to say and to spread their message that Germany was not defeated, that this was all you know, a political maneuver by the Jews and by the left wing and I don't know, whatever. So don't get me wrong, but that, that was not possible after World War II. So that destruction and the complete um, uh, 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 um, um, defeat and the unconditional surrender that was demanded from, from the Wehrmacht and the leadership somehow gave Germany the opportunity really to start new and to also embrace the help that was offered. And that's why I'm cautious to use the term Marshall Plan for Africa, which was the economics cooperation minister, not the foreign minister, I have to say. That's German politics, but the German foreign minister did not knew about the concept, but that's another story. Um, we have problems in Africa. We have severe problems in Africa, but there are also success stories. So I think it needs a plan and, and a country like the United States willing and able to provide help. But the recovery was also product of, of the European people that started anew. Mm. And I mean, it's interesting to see that the, the Eastern European governments already under, under the umbrella of the Soviet Union wanted to take part in this and where were prevented by doing so by, by Stalin and, and, and the, the Soviet, Soviet uh, government. So, so it, it's, it's a help, it's a political message, but also I would say the industrious people of, of Europe that took the chance. Um, I believe that we can make the case also for a long-term policy of economic support. And it's necessary to do this. You know, in my country, we are having a debate about foreign policy which I never remembered before. Um, when I was re-elected to parliament in 2013 at the Munich Security Conference, Thomas knows this very well, there was a very important speech by then federal president Gauck um, talking about what Germany needs to do and to step up uh, our efforts in, in taking the lead in some of the foreign policy issues. I, I think we, would, we are doing this today. And it's somehow the crisis made it easier to explain to my constituents that it's necessary to invest money. And I maybe want to use one example. The German government, the chancellor and the foreign minister went to the London conference where we pledged for um, the help for Syrian refugees. And the Senate knows this. It was very diffi difficult to get the money for UNHCR World Food Program to provide the necessary money, the minimum help, um, the food rations for Syrian refugees in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Turkey, in northern Iraq. And and at the end of the day, the German government said, well, we, we're going to pay for this. So we, we pledged 2.3 billion, I guess, uh, until 2018. We are roughly paying 50% of the WFP budget for the Syrian refugees without any public outrage or opposition in parliament. That's no guarantee that there won't be any dispute about this, but people understand that there is a link between living conditions, economic prosperity, and the crisis that we are facing. So the Marshall Plan cannot be used as a blueprint for the challenges that we are facing today, but, but, but the, the strategic wisdom of, of Marshall, but I read, I don't know if that is true, but that President Truman was afraid that the plan would maybe not pass Congress when when his name was adapted. So uh, maybe we would have the, the German Marshall. Truman uh, Fund or whatever. But, um, but that, is, that is required today. And that's why I, I can only agree with the senator that it was too bad that we were not able to put together a sufficient package of political, economic, um, and, and maybe even military aid for those countries that were reaching for a more democratic society. Yeah.
So, and I want to open this to all of you in just a minute, but I have one last question for Ambassador O'Sullivan, and it strikes me that a theme, actually, in, in both comments that were just made, an underlying theme is leadership, and where does leadership come from? And I think this is a question that a lot of Europeans are asking today in the wake of the French election. There is an expectation that perhaps we'll see a reinvigorated Franco-German couple that will provide leadership in an EU context. Uh, do you think it's going to come from particular member states? Will it come from a Juncker or a Tusk? But where do you see leadership in the European context coming from? Well, uh, before I answer that, Karen, and I, I will try to answer it, it's challenging. Uh, I just want to agree with the two previous speakers. I mean, I think the, as Chardin said, it takes two to tango, talking about transatlantic relations. In, in a Marshall Plan type situation, it takes two to tango. And I think the point Mr. Anand made is, is very important that, that Mr. Anand made, that, that um, you need the, resist, the, the receptiveness on the side of, of the, 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 the countries or the country where you're trying to do this. And that is where we have frequently come unstuck in, in recent times. Uh, we, we could imagine a reconstruction plan for Syria, but first of all, you need a political framework and process which could actually use that money well, and, mm -hmm. and so on. The, the other point, I think, unfortunately, is there are so many challenges globally. Uh, you know, it's not, in, in that time, the main focus at that point was on the sort of transatlantic and was on Europe. And it was, it was credible to make that sort of laser-like focus on the transatlantic relationship through the Marshall Plan. Today, no sooner have you had a conference about Syria than someone is saying, what about Afghanistan? And someone is saying, well, what about Ukraine? And, and so the, there is a sense in which it is much harder to mobilize public opinion around a, a well-reasoned argument, well, we need to make this investment now because you know that two months later something else will come up. So how we manage that as the international community, and there I, I think that's, you know, it comes back to some of the, the difficulties of, of the international community, the United Nations. Frankly, as we were discussing the, the issue of the Syrian refugees, I mean, the, the, the US and the EU and our member states collectively, we were funding massively uh, U, UNHCR and, and the World <laughs> Food Program. Uh, in uh, Lebanon, Jordan, and, and Turkey. Uh, where was the rest of the world? Where were the Gulf states? Where were other wealthy donors who are not, frankly, stepping up? And, and how do you then explain that? And, and I think that's part of the challenge. Now, in terms of leadership in Europe, I hope I've talked enough, I only have to be very brief on that subject. Um, <laughs> look, I, we could spend hours on that. I, I, th there is never going to be, in my view, a sort of predetermined sense of leadership that's going to be this and that. I think much of it, many of us would greatly wish for uh, a, a, a slightly more invigorated Franco-German partnership. I think that is something which has been missing. Frankly, if we hadn't had Brexit, I would have tried to include the UK in that. And I think the UK had an opportunity, actually, to play that role. And unfortunately, is now taking a different direction, so it's not going to play that role. Um, but I, of course, coming from a, a small member state, and, and uh, I think it's very important that any such leadership also takes into account the fact that the, the medium and smaller member states need a stake in this too. So it can, it's a process whereby you can have a certain impetus, but at the end of the day, we have to figure out how we do this together. I think everyone has agreed that the, the situation in which we are, the, the sense of disillusionment of many of our citizens with, with lots of things, uh, after the financial crisis and the economic crisis, leaves us with a problem of, of communication, but also of, of policy, how to build a, a more optimistic future. Uh, and I think we all hope that when we've got this sort of series of elections this year uh, past us, that we can then focus on that. We will, of course, be somewhat distracted by the Brexit discussion, but I hope in many ways that will also help the rest of us to focus our minds and to, we have to deal with Brexit, but frankly, we also have to address how we rebuild a sense of optimism and confidence for the rest of us in this European project, which has brought so much, which I think you can say has been hugely beneficial, but where we, people don't necessarily feel that in their gut in the way that we need, and that's, that will be the challenge. I hope it can start with a Franco-German uh, sense of renewed impetus, but it, it, needs, it needs to be built out to, to, to en encompass the whole 27. So over to all of you, who, who wants to jump in? And I'm going to sort of do the roving talk show host thing. So I'm going to just introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Contessa Bourbon from the New York Times. 
I'd like to ask them, um, what should be Euro Europe and US do to realize a political settlement in Syria? Then uh, you can also plan the Marshall Plan. What should be your move or action? All right, should who wants take to a, take that Why one? don't we take a couple? How about that? Good. Let's take a couple yes. questions. Hi, thanks for a very interesting discussion. Uh, I'm at the Embassy of, of uh, Ireland here, and uh, just to recall, first of all, uh, one of your predecessors, Senator, Senator Mitchell, who made such a great contribution to advancing peace and reconciliation in Northern Ireland, which was, of course, a, uh, a project which benefited in, in, in enormously also from the European Union. And just to recall that, even though it's obviously very small in the, in the global uh, scale, that, that that is an example of uh, EU and US uh, uh, working together, which our uh, Prime Minister took the opportunity to uh, to to remind uh, the uh, 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 President Trump that that we've greatly valued the contribution that European peace and security um, has has made to Ireland in all sorts of ways, and also the uh, the transatlantic uh, uh, relationship. Thank you. And I'm going to take one last question, and then we'll come back to you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I'm Richard Cronin <clears throat> from the uh, Henry L. Stimson Soci uh, Center and uh, also a former colleague of Karen uh, uh, Donfried at, uh, at CRS a long time ago. Uh, anyway, uh, Mike, it was a very in interesting discussion. I, I want to follow up on something that uh, Mr. Anand said, and that is uh, about not comparing uh, everything to a Marshall, calling everything a Marshall Plan. Uh, and uh, I think the, the reasoning is fairly obvious, but uh, the main point is that um, uh, that was those were special circumstances. Uh, so, and the scale, the scope of everything is, you know, nothing like that can be done now. But the other part of it, though, was that there was an enormously pragmatic approach. Uh, and uh, it seems that uh, the question to me is, um, how can both the European countries and the United States, you know, how, how do we find a way <clears throat> for a narrative that, that poses a higher kind of uh, pragmatism, not, not just commercial advantage, not just jobs, you know, also, but a higher kind of pragmatism that balances our, our various uh, mutual nat national interests, uh, both economic and security and other, other factors. Thank you. Let me respond on the Syria question. And I'm only responding because I don't have any answers. You know. um, I think about it, when I watch the horrific stories about what's happened in Syria, I often think about the American Civil War and what I know about the history of our Civil War, which was so horrific and so many people were killed and it you know, it devastated, certainly it devastated the South for many years. Um, and, and the fact that that only ended when people were exhausted. Um, and it, it, it doesn't feel like, to date anyway, we've been able to rally the international community in a way that has been able to come up with a solution or bring the parties together in a way that can help um, create a ceasefire. Now, there has been this new proposal about safe zones that's mm -hmm. come out of Russia um, that President Trump has suggested would be something that he would like to look at. Um, I think Russia is going to, clearly is going to have to be at the table. Um, I think Iran probably is going to have to be part of those negotiations. And hopefully the U.S. will get back into those negotiations. Um, but until we can see some way of reconciling Assad um, in Syria, which I think the opposition, find, and I'm not supporting that, but there has to be some way of dealing with him and moving him out 
before there's going to be acceptance on the part of the warring factions there to see a resolution. And we just, I don't think we see that yet. And as mm -hmm. Ambassador O'Sullivan has said, this is probably the most horrific tragedy I've seen in my lifetime. And it feels like the international community has been powerless to address it. I, I, I would completely agree on the Syria issue. I also cannot provide um, a solution, but I don't believe that we are in a stage of the conflict where the reconstruction is center um, of our discussions. Uh, we have had United Nations Security Council resolution demanding access to the suffering um, civilians in Syria, access for humanitarian aid, which is not, as you know, reconstruction, or it's not, or at least it should not be politicized. What we are seeing is that the regime very systematically is preventing this from happening, but we also see that opposition forces, where they have the military capacity, using the same tactics as the regime, um, cutting population from electricity, from food, from free movement, uh, using um, bombardments and other terrorist uh, instruments, including chemical, chemical attacks. So we need, in the first step, to assure that the basics of international law is going to be applied in Syria. And so humanitarian assistance, but also medical help, should be not politicized in a conflict. And by the way, it's illegal to do this. But we see targeting of hospitals, targeting of medical aid workers. Uh, and that needs to stop, not only because of the suffering of the Syrian people, but it is setting a precedent for other conflicts in the world. So the, the international community really needs to step up. And I think we need to work on this together, Europe and the United States. We have a clear interest in a peaceful solution of the Syria conflict. My country has never been involved in Syria in the way that we are involved today. Also because of the refugee situation, but it's, and I'm speaking as a European, this is our neighborhood, our European neighborhood. It's, it's less than five hours flight from my hometown. And so we, we need to support the political process, and I really hope that this administration is going to support the United Nations and the special envoy of the United Nations, because you know we could use all the time here to talk about Syria. But at the end of the day, whether there will be a political settlement or there will be a kind of peace out of exhaustion, and we saw that in, in, in neighboring um, Lebanon, by the way, after 15 years of war. We cannot afford 15 years of war in Syria. But then we need to <coughs> provide a platform that could be accepted by, by the Syrian actors, but also by the regional powers. And I only see the United Nations. So we need to strengthen that system, and I think that we are willing to do this politically, economically, and, and then we can move forward. To your question, just, just very briefly, um, I mean, we, we can identify a lot of fields of cooperation. And this is usually what we are doing. We are addressing problems as politicians. And rightfully so, but I think also we need to remind ourselves that, and I'm coming back to the United Nations, if we look at the Millennium Development Goals, the balance sheet is not perfect, but there's also progress in parts of the world, and we usually don't talk about this. So um, access to clean water, access to basic medical um, treatment has improved over the last years, and we need to make sure that this progress has not been endangered. And it's very easy. If there is a military conflict going on, this progress has been destroyed almost. So there, there are a lot of reasons to work together uh, to try to support peaceful developments in, in 
almost all over the planet, but we have some, I think, priorities because we are directly affected. And, and, uh, and we also need to defend our basic democratic values. And I am going to tell you, this is not only happening maybe in, in this country, but we see when European leaders are traveling to China. Ten years ago, they all would have addressed human rights issues. We have a dialogue established about economics, which is very important. We do good business with China. We want to continue this. But we have a dialogue about the rule of law and human rights. And our experience is that other important democracies are not addressing the issue anymore. Because they believe that maybe they have an advantage in doing business or attracting investment. So, so we need to remind ourselves on what, what it is that, that, that established our, our relationship, transatlantic relationship, but also I think on, on, on this special day for Europeans, we need to remind ourselves that we need to stay not united on every detail, of course not, but that is important and we are losing credibility when we criticize developments that are concerning all over the world if we, if we don't do this also, um, or even if we are maybe uh, facing economic uh, difficulties. Just to, since I'm Irish, I can't help but acknowledge the, the contribution of a colleague from the Irish Embassy. I mean, I, I do think the contribution of the European Union to the peace process in Northern Ireland was remarkable, in, including joint membership of the EU by the UK and Ireland. And unfortunately, Brexit is now going to pose a challenge for that and how we, how we fix that in, in, a, in a way which doesn't bring back some of the, 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 the difficulties of the past is going to be a challenge. And I, I know the Irish government is very grateful for the fact that they've had such support within Europe to, to the fact that that has to be one of the priorities of, of the Brexit discussion. To the other points, look, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I, I think what we have to recognize is that there was maybe once a time when agreement between the United States and Europe was a, a sufficient condition to move the dial on, on almost any international event. Uh, that's no longer the case, visibly. There are, there are other actors out there uh, who have a strong uh, influence and a role to play. I still think it is the necessary condition uh, for building a consensus. But, uh, and to Mr. Anandpoint in particular, I, I think um, we, we need a multilateral framework that works. Uh, otherwise, we can't find solutions to these problems. I mean, why were we unable to do something in Syria? It was because we were consistently blocked uh, in the Security Council by Russia and China, who, who feared that we had overreached in what we did in Libya, and they said, well, we're not going to give you a license for regi regime change in, in Syria. So how do we reinvigorate the inter... I mean, the tragedy, as, as Senator Shaheen has said, of Syria is that the international community has stood by while this went on. Now, you can say that, well, this was because there's a, a massive conflict and how do, we, how do we stop them from fighting each other? And there's an element of truth to that. I can't help but think that if we could have had a better international consensus to stop the bloodshed and, and to create uh, the conditions for some kind of political discussion, uh, this, this, would have, this would have averted you know, not only the huge loss of life and destruction in Syria, but the, the, the flood of refugees into the neighboring countries who have borne a huge uh, burden uh, uh, Lebanon, Jordan, and, and Turkey, and of course then indirectly Europe, which also uh, uh, saw, saw further influx. So I think investing, continuing to invest in the United Nations, in the multilateral organization, is absolutely indispensable for both the US and the EU if we are to uh, try and have international solutions to these crisis situations around the world. So we're getting close to the end, but I think there was one hand by the pillar. Yes, <laughs> there you are. Let's pull you in. And then. Um, while Karen's doing that, let me just add to what you both have said. I mean, Russia has been a very bad actor in Syria. Um, they have, their involvement has really extended this conflict, as you pointed out, their uh, blocking of anything happening at uh, the UN, and then their bombing of hospitals and aid workers is just unconscionable. And so I think it's important to, to put that out there because I don't know how, how we influence them, but, but they have really been 
a bad player in all of this. I agree. Thank you. I'm Katerina Soku with Greek Daily Kathimarini. Uh, the Eurozone crisis has created a divergence of fortunes between the North and the South in Europe. And I'm wondering whether you think this is threatening European integration and how you think it should be addressed going forward. Mm -hmm. I'm going to defer to you all. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'll, 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 I think a, a European Union of 28 countries necessarily has many sort of fault lines throughout it because we are not uh, uh, countries of different sizes, countries of different economic development. Um, I, I, I think it's wrong to focus too much on that. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to try and uh, find solutions, common solu European solutions to common European problems, whether that is the functioning of the euro, which I think was exposed by the financial crisis, some weaknesses in the architecture of the euro. We've repaired a lot of that, but it's still unfinished business, and we need, we, there is still work to be done uh, in making the architecture of economic and monetary union as solid as it needs to be to resist uh, a future uh, a crisis. And that includes uh, addressing, as I think we have tried to do, some of the, the, the structural inequalities that, that are there. Uh, and I, I, I think, uh, frankly, the economic situation is now more optimistic, and I, I think there, there is a return to growth. But it should not lead us to complacency. It should lead us to, to use the breathing space of a, of a slightly more, more positive growth to actually address some of those outstanding issues. And I hope that that can be done once we're through uh, the, the election. We know it's not a, not a great moment uh, uh, to, to start raising these issues in the immediate uh, run-up to, to elections uh, of, of, of important uh, countries who, who who, who may have to make a contribution to that. So, uh, so but I, I think we, we need to look at the future development of the European Union, taking into account the situation of everyone. Uh, it's not just a north-south, it's not just an east-west, uh, it's not just a large-small, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a mosaic, and we know, we, we know how it works, we know how we've done it in the past, I think we have the, the tools to do it in the future, uh, and I'm, I'm relatively confident that uh, the, the, the sense of momentum that I sense is there with the 27, uh, once we've been through this, uh, this year of elections, uh, will hopefully, will lead us to uh, uh, find solutions to some of those outstanding problems. But let's not underestimate just how far we have already come uh, since the financial crisis of, of 2008 to 2009, because I think uh, a huge amount has been done. Well, I, I mean, I, I agree with what the ambassador said. I, Somehow the, the, the elephant in the room here seems to be um, an aspect that has been also addressed by President Trump, which is the German trade surplus. And of course the um, insistence on fiscal stability or some would say austerity policies. And I personally don't believe that um, there's a one size fits all policy to solve the problems in some of the European countries. And we should also be very cautious in comparing the different also economic and structural problems. Um, I studied in Spain with, with an Erasmus scholarship many years ago. So I have a lot of friends there still. The economic problems in Spain are not the same as we are facing in Greece, for example. Um, so we need, I think, to address the aspects that are the responsibility of national governments, also the economic actors, the social partners. And we need to distinguish this from some of the reasons that are more like general and European trends. And I, I hope that all the um, German top politicians that have been congratulating uh, Mr. Macron to his election victory, and who all have underlined the importance of working together and strengthening the European Union in times where, I mean, we're all happy about the result, but uh, there's a far-right candidate who, who got 30% or more of the vote. And we had the same in the Netherlands. And we have um, my neighboring country from a Hamburg perspective almost as Denmark, and that government is depending on a far right-wing party. So it's not only the 
poorer countries, it's also the very, very rich Scandinavian countries. We need to address the issues. And we need to create sustainable solutions and growth. So Germany will may disappoint some of, of, of its friends because even if we would change 100% our, our policy on fiscal matters, it will not solve all the economic problems in the Eurozone. But more flexibility will be needed. And that's a complicated issue, especially in an election year. But everybody who really believes that we need a new start uh, between France and Germany cannot honestly say so without listening to some of the economic ideas of Mr. Macron. Doesn't mean that we have to adapt 100% of, of his wish list, but we need to sit with him and we need to be more, a little bit more, I hate the word, but need to be a little more generous and more flexible on some of the very strong ideological uh, um, 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 parameters of our policy. So that will be the litmus test. And again, we need um, wise leadership and we need the ability to think in, in a long-term perspective. And that's maybe where we, at the end of the discussions and end again by leaders like Marshall and Truman and others in, in, in Congress. Well said. So I now have a three round of things <coughs> I want to give. This was the first event that GMF is involved in kicking off this anniversary year of the market. <coughs> and we'll be doing events in Paris and Berlin and all over and with partners and other organizations that care about this. But the point is not just to look back and celebrate that past, but it's really about how you live the values and principles of the Marshall Plan today. And I really can't think of a better opening than the three of you, because each in your own professional home, whether it's the US Senate, the German Parliament, the EU, are pushing for these same values and principles today. And I think the discussion made very clear that this is also not a time for complacency but a time for people to stand up for the things they believe in. So very appreciative to the three of you for helping us have this conversation. My second thanks goes to all of you for taking the time to come and be a part of it. And I do just want to give a special shout out to our ambassadors who came, and also to Deputy Secretary Tribble from the State Department. His state is actually kicking off a new program that's focused on young transatlantic innovation leaders. And it's about bringing 100 young Europeans to the US to have an experience here looking at an issue that I think animates the next generation on both sides of the Atlantic. And I think that's also part of the shared future. And I'm happy to say we're, we're part of this project with State. So thank you very much for that. Um, and my last thanks is we have the fun of having the conversation. But this came together because of my wonderful colleagues at GMF and the wonderful colleagues you all have. So I'll do a special shout out to Rita Joe, but really everyone who helped pull this together. Thank you. So please join me in thanking all of you.